Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, yeah, my name is Dave Cook. I'm the Director of Undergraduate Research uh, here at UAH. Uh, and today's uh, opportunity is uh, so that um, students can see uh, what's happening with our Summer Community of Scholars uh, research program. So uh, whether you're a high school student currently or uh, a newly admitted UAH student, this is a program we have on campus in the summer in which undergraduates can work with a faculty or a research staff mentor uh, over the summer and we basically pay them a stipend which means it's uh, it's money but it's not like a job it's it's more like they receive these funds so that they can pay for their rent and for food and they don't have to worry about having a part-time job they can just focus on doing the research so it's in a, a pretty intensive 10-week uh, program, but a lot of hands-on uh, work, basically. So uh, today uh, we have uh, the um, pre presentation on the online uh, wind tunnel. So this is a really interesting project. Uh, Dr. Canistris is the mentor. Uh, David's our undergraduate student. Um, and so they're going to talk a little bit about the project. Uh, you know, feel free. This is a really good opportunity for you to ask questions, you know, of the student doing the research of a faculty member who works with uh, a student on this project. Uh, and toward the end, I'll put a link in the chat that, that tells more about the summer program. Uh, but at this point, you know, enough of me talking and I will turn this over to our presenters so that they can talk about their summer. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Cook, for, for the introductions. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Kostas Kanistras. I am an assistant professor at UAH since uh, 2018. This is my third year now. I am working, uh, I am teaching fluid mechanics, uh, um, aircraft stability and control, and I'm the coordinator of the aerodynamics labs uh, here at UAH. Uh, my research part, I am focusing on um, experimental aerodynamics and flow control. So I will uh, walk with you. Please stop me at any time you have any questions to ask. Uh, I will walk you through a little bit with my, I have my laptop here. So I will show you around what, what you, you expect to see in an aerodynamics uh, lab, on a, in a research aerodynamics lab, I will say. And then I will walk through the, like the corridor, it's really close here. And uh, that I will show you also the aerodynamics labs that undergraduate students are taking that course as a, and they, they gain hands-on experience in uh, aerodynamics. Okay, so what you see here, uh, let me just see if I can, I cannot do that. So what you can see here as you walk into the lab, you will see a closed circuit wind tunnel. Wind tunnels, if we are not familiar with what a wind tunnel does, is basically a simulation of a flight. And instead of having the aircraft flying in air, you have the aircraft fixed, and then you just uh, throw flow at it to uh, simulate the behavior of the flow. So what you can see here is a wind tunnel model sitting there for an experiment. You can see high resolution cameras there, four cameras, so we can uh, visualize the particles that we uh, shoot. We have an atomizer here. As you can see, this is basically a bubble generator. This generate, generates bubbles at 15 microns. Um, they are heavier than air. And basically what you can see, you can illuminate the laser sheet that you can see here, the optics. This is a laser and the optics up there. You can illuminate those particles and you can basically see the particles using the cameras and then you can characterize the flow. So this system is called particle image velocimetry system, okay? And the closed loop uh, tunnel that you see here, basically it allows us to control temperature density during the experiment, okay? And you will need that sealer for that. I forgot to mention that uh, you will need, in order to control the temperature in that uh, wind tunnel, you will need a sealer as you can see here, okay? And we also have a small uh, maker space that we have uh, two 3D printers and we have a room here in the back <clears throat> and tools is my PhD student over there. And you can see the 3D printers that we have here that we 3D print our models. So this is the research um, aerodynamics lab. I will go and I will show you now the aerodynamics lab um, that I mentioned earlier. It's actually where David is 
sitting right now. So as you enter here, you will see an Thank you, Froze. Am I frozen? No, no, okay, no, you're good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Though. Yeah. Okay. So uh, here, what you will see is the section that we have the control section that we have the computer and the duct system and you can see the wind tunnel this wind tunnel has a smaller testing section the one that i showed you earlier is about 18 by 18 by 72 inches this is a 12 by 12 by 24 inches and here we have a, right now is set up for a, a flat plate we can we, we basically measure direct force measurement and uh, pressure measurement during the experiments, uh, we have bluff bodies. We see different airfoils, how they perform, uh, the lift and drag. And these are kind of the tests, six in total labs we run, experiments we lab in this lab. Okay. Now, with the pandemic, we had to find ways to one, engage the students, and two, run online labs. So, what we did, which I admit, and most of us admit, is not the most um, uh, efficient way in terms of the student learning uh, because the students will were what we how we handled it basically it was we were giving videos to the students and they we were giving data to the students and the students were able to run from home the online version we also had face to face during the pandemic with all the safety measures but we had smaller groups okay so one thing to improve that in the future is to introduce online wind tunnel wind tunnels. What is an online wind tunnel, you may ask? Basically, you will have the opportunity sitting at home. Again, you cannot get hands-on experience in, a, in an environment like what we all lived in the, couple, uh, the, the, the last couple of years, but you can actuate and run your experiment from home without relying on someone giving you some data. How you can do that? Basically, we can automate the system and we can have a website that you can access and you can perform the tests at your own time. Uh, and you can run any different cases you like and you can collect the data and then you can analyze the data. So this is what David and Alan, that unfortunately he's not here with us today, uh, they have been working the last 10 weeks. They are trying to develop a system like this and now David is going to walk you through. I will show you the wind tunnel and most likely he will do in a bit. This is a smaller wind tunnel that we have here. And uh, this is the one that we used and we're trying to convert it to an online wind tunnel. David, the floor is yours. All right. Well, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Ministros. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, I can share my screen and run the presentation that we prepared. Share this. Fantastic. So as you know, my name is David Tutanju. I am a senior here at UAH, and I've been working on this online wind tunnel project, the development of an online wind tunnel for the RCU 2021. All right. So the team uh, above, you can see what Alan looks like. He's actually a junior here studying aerospace engineering as well. Uh, he's on this team. He focuses primarily on the software side of the project, working on the virtual controls so that you can actually control through your computer and not have to be here touching the buttons themselves, data collection and website structure. I'm focusing on the hardware, focusing on the support structure, the physical controls and the data analysis. That way we can determine whether or not the results uh, being shown through the website, being shown through the software are accurate relative to what should be seen. In the future, I wanted to shift my research towards propulsion, but for now I'm working in the aerodynamic side. So the reason, the motivation for this, well, traditional hands-on aerodynamics laboratories are very effective educationally to teach complex aerodynamics concepts or to show concept, complex aerodynamics concepts taught in lectures. However, this imposes a lot of space, it imposes a lot of time, personal costs on the educational institution. Uh, so it costs a lot of money to actually have 
a wind tunnel here, you need to find space for it. You need to have time for people to train up and learn how to use it. And these costs can significantly be reduced if you just convert to an online laboratory and have it available over a distance. So if multiple institutions want to use a single wind tunnel, but it's automated and everybody can from a distance, this is a viable solution. Um, and we want to make this a research project because aerodynamics labs are usually difficult to cover or they're difficult to cover in an online setting uh, and these labs especially are difficult to convert to online teaching. Primary objective was to modify an existing wind tunnel so that it can be accessed remotely by high school students initially conducting a lab experiment. Uh, the students would have to follow a lab manual online that will be provided and they would have to have access to the required theory that they'll need to know. So the theory would be available on the actual website. However, it should be covered in the class. Um, the students will also be able to interact with the equipment through the online web portal. They can change the angle of attack um, and possibly wind speed in the coming future. To conduct the experiment, they would have to be able to save data, plot lift, drag coefficients against the angle of attack, see how everything changes relative to the wind speed and to the angle that the piece is in. The wind tunnel itself, it was shown earlier. You see a picture off to your right. Uh, it has variable speed on a half horsepower DC motor. Its maximum speed is 27 meters per second. Uh, that's about 50 miles an hour or so of wind. The test bay is actually just six by six by 18 inches, as you can see right here. This test bay, I think I can focus in on that. That's just the six inch by six inch by 18 inches long. That is the total area. It's Overall dimensions is it's a seven foot long wind tunnel, 21 inch by 21 inch out inlet. Um, it's not a large one by any means, but it's good for in the basic step. For conversion. So the way we want to approach this project and the way we want to approach this research was to initially fabricate and exchange the existing support structure for one that can actually change the angle of attack. To do that, you can see figure two, where we've actually mounted it on. Uh, that was in this chart. We were using this. <laughs> support plate now because you can actually change the setup. You can actually change the angle of attack of a beam that you would insert into the hole. And by changing that angle, you impose different aerodynamic forces. Uh, to do this, we would attach stepper motors to the back that can change, that then change it to an accurate angle. Um, and later on, we're gonna be changing the wind speed using a stepper motor or a servo. We're going to splice in some wires for the on-off control in the uh, control box itself. That way we don't have to integrate more hardware and we can theoretically keep it a bit simpler. I'll try and set this on the ground. We're also making a GUI, a graphical user interface. And we're trying to put that into the website for the controls to make it intuitive, easy to use, and easy to understand. And eventually we want to put up a camera so the students can actually see what it's like inside the wind tunnel. Down there, you can see the initial mock of what we thought it was going to look like at first for the student side graphic user interface. Uh, as far as outreach goes on this project, this project is in part an outreach effort to work with local high schools or distance high schools in general. We would be creating a lab manual for each lab. It would include the background information, some worksheets, some videos to get the students up to speed and hopefully answer any questions they have. Uh, they would need to create a method. The, we will need to create a method to schedule an appointment with the lab. So far, we've just been going through a through a simple form sheet that can be filled out by the student. Then they would have an appointment to come in or to log on, and they would have access to the web wallet. Then uh, we are going we are going to be integrating a graphic user interface to make it easier to use, easier to understand, and we're probably going to have a password on there. That way, no one that just has the link to the website can come on, use it, possibly mess up the wind tunnel maybe even break something, but that's also another safety concern. We are gonna be getting into contact with schools so they can try out the lab, test it out, make sure that it works if they ever wanna actually use it in production. Ongoing research, we have so far created a rough draft in the structure of the website. Uh, most of the values in there are placeholders for when we have finalized the design. We have so far calibrated the strain gauge beam in the fixed support format because that's the original way it came in. Um, right now, the way we have it capable of rotating, it wasn't able to do that before. So we need to make sure we understood the whole calibration process for this hardware specifically. 
We verified this calibration by just running a couple of example tests. So as you can see on the right, um, for the golf ball for bluff body drag experiment for comparison to the original. We have designed, fabricated, installed new support structure for the strain gauge beam, as you can see installed. Um, we calibrated the new structure to the mountain position, referencing the original fixed body. And modifications still need to be made for easy recalibration. That is, we need to make it easy to remove uh, and set up for calibrating purposes. Because applying a sideways force rather than a straight down force is a bit difficult. We're going to get into that during the calibration phase of this presentation. Additionally, we've created a draft for the graphic user interface. That, as you can see on the right, it has live plotting and shows the drag and lift at different wind speeds whenever it's on. Um, you have the big red stop button to make sure that if anything is happening or you need to stop collecting data, it's easier to do. It shows you the original drag, the original lift, uh, tear, non tear, so on and so forth. And with this GUI, you can actually see all the specifications on the sensors we use themselves. Uh, this just makes it easier for us to debug and find any problems in our code. Right now, it still needs optimization on data output and data collection regarding the lift. It's giving us a bit of noise, uh, but we are working to solve that problem. We are also currently integrating controls for remotely operating the wind tunnel uh, through virtual buttons. So instead of having these physical buttons up here, well, as you can see in figure seven, the wiring of it, um, we're just going to be running some extra wires in there that can be plugged into an Arduino. And through that, students will be able to control it through a web page. That's what a micro, uh, microcontroller is as well, basically. So the website itself, uh, this is the old home page for it. I have pulled up the website on a different tab. And if I can find my mouse, here it is. I will pause my share and see if I can switch over to a different screen. Where is it? It is over here. Share this. So on this website, you have the home page, which shows you the initial wind tunnel itself. Uh, as you can see, we changed the color scheme a little bit to make it a bit more appealing to the eyes and all that. Scroll down a little bit, you get some basic information on the wind tunnel, uh, what it is, model type and everything. Uh, you can also find the exact website to see if there's anything else you can do with it that needs to be done. On the home page, you can Schedule an appointment through the simple form, as I mentioned earlier. You can see the lessons tab where we have lesson one and lesson two. The first one's going to be focusing on the angle of attack and how that changes lift and drag. And the lesson two will eventually be how it changes relative to wind speed, specifically. Uh, the lab page will bring up the graphic user interface we discussed before. Right now, all of these are placeholder variables. Uh, and this should be something similar to what the students will see eventually. We also have a call number and emergency contact in case something does go wrong and someone is not here. In the frequently asked questions, we would, we're going to have the basis, the background information that students will need in order to complete any of these lab reports. This is in addition to the lessons that we mentioned earlier. Now I'm gonna move back over to the presentation screen. So as you saw earlier, the initial draft of student view mock-up during the experiment and how it looked. Up. So the way we calibrate the strain gauge, essentially initially um, as control, control being the basis when nothing has changed, was we removed it from the wind tunnel. We had to take it out. That way we could hang some weights from it. We hang calibrated weights that are certified calibrated. Uh, so we know exactly what we're putting on there. We had to level it out to make sure all the forces were going in a specific direction perpendicular to the actual beam. We then used the software to zero out the sensor uh, when we aren't putting any force on it. That way the sensor knows nothing's being done. Here's how it's, here's the different mathematics that it needs to do in order to verify it. We then put on a kilogram, about a thousand grams on there. We take it away. And if it is reading zero, then that's good. Uh, we also kind of Put it back on there and let me restart that sentence. 
first we place a kilogram of weight on the beam. We then tell the software that it is reading a kilogram of weight. That way it has the right linear modifier, the right slope to assess any other weight that might be on there. At this point, we would start removing the weight slowly and waiting for the sensor to level out and actually read the correct thing. We would keep going until there's no weight on the beam. If it reads zero at that point, then fantastic. Everything's working as it should. If it's not, then we had to start with a lower weight and determine what the maximum force applied available on the beam is. Um, we would then have to put the full weight back on the beam and calibrate from there, just to verify everything. After this, in order to calibrate the rotating platform, um, we just rotate the mount 90 degrees. On the rotating platform, that just means you have to rotate the actual beam itself. On the fixed platform, you have to rotate the entire thing and reclamp it down, level it out. We have to tear it again, and then we just have to take the same lift points and follow the same weight procedure as before for the different as you can see the way. So the fabrication of the support system. In the initial concept was to make a whole plate that would sit underneath the rotating platform and use that to be to make it extremely secure and perfectly well dot every time. Uh, the new design is just some simple aluminum rail that we drilled holes into and mounted on the structure. Some modifications have been made since mounting it uh, to make to ensure that it is consistently level in a consistent spot. The next steps after this, where we have to go from here, is we have to finish the new support fabrication, uh, as in we have to make that quick release method for quick recalibration, but also have it be reliable enough that every time we try to put it back on, it's in the same exact spot with no changes. We have to calibrate it with the new support, and that really means we have to integrate that quick release, or we have to develop a new method of calibration using sideways or lateral forces. That way we can get accurate results every single time. We then have to begin or at least continue integrating the Arduino. We have, we're using a code called LabVIEW to actually control everything and to read all the data. We need to code it to control an Arduino and through the Arduino, the angle of attack, the speed, and whether or not the wind tunnel is on or off. Of course, that'll be on the timer to, as another safety measure. Uh, from here, we also still have to make the actual lesson for the lab based on the forces and the angle of attack and what the wind tunnel is capable of. For example, we would have to go from, we have to calculate the coefficient of lift at an angle of attack or alpha of negative 12 to positive 18 degrees in increments of about two degrees. Uh, we would also ask the students, how does coefficient of lift change with wind speed as another lab example. We could also do another lab where we combine both efforts and have the students optimize the angle of attack and the wind speed for a specific variable. More future work. Where we, expand, where we expect or hope that this project will go in the future would be to expand design into larger systems. That way we could put models larger than um, simple airfoils or put anything other than an airfoil in the wind tunnel. It's like a model car or a small airplane model um, to see how it interacts with different winds at different speeds. We could also theoretically expand to the commercial sex sector, uh, NASCAR or car companies for aerodynamics testing on their vehicles. We could work with small aerospace companies where they have designs, but they don't have a space in which they want. They can test it at speed. Um, they could send us a model, we load it in here, we give them a time on the wind tunnel through the website, and they can test at least the wind speed and angle of attack and how that in influences their design. We would also continue to be a part of outreach. We could become a part of a high school lab in aerodynamics. Uh, we can work with multiple high schools for that. We can work with possibly even down to middle schools if they want to simply try to simplify their lessons far enough. Uh, this could also be used in virtual demonstrations for telecommuting students or international high schools. I uh, work with the International Office of International Services Office at UAH uh, to try and enhance what students will learn in their own classes. Possibly this could also be expanded to be used in university lectures and labs 
if and when telecommuting becomes a necessity. Uh, for example, if anybody needs to take an online course because they're out of the country or they're deathly ill at home, they would still be able to participate in the labs and lectures from that space without endangering themselves or others. Professors could also use this digital format if they just uh, sign up for the lab space online at a specific time. If they want to illustrate what they really mean by coefficient of drag, coefficient of lift, and how it changes, um, how wind speed influences things during their lecture, they can do that as well. I believe that's it. Is there are there any questions from students or otherwise? Thank you, David. <clears throat> so, do you have any questions for either uh, me or David? Anything that you found? Yeah, go ahead, George. I was just wondering, uh, in the future, do y'all plan to have uh, automated ways to interchange your models so that you don't have to have a personnel with the wind tunnel uh, at all times? Uh, are you talking about the physical lab or this online approach? Uh, the physical lab. It, it, Y'all were talking about how you need to sometimes change the model for the virtual lab. So having a method to change it without a person there might. Uh, that, that will be very risky. Mm -hmm. and that you you rely on the person that is operating it that he's going to be or she is going to be using the the system properly so for safety for 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 the equipment safety uh, we shouldn't do that um we even even we were even not considering allowing changes in the speed or restricting them restricting the maximum speed and even if we do that we will have to have a timer because imagine someone who comes into that uh, online forum right Oper starts the tunnel and then the tunnel runs for five days so and then it burns the motor and we have to replace things so i wouldn't do that i would set up an experiment and then I would say from this day to that day, this is the experiment we're running. And then I would have one of my TAs or me uh, come and replace that model and change the experiment instead. We saw a really good, and uh, if you reach out to David or me, we, we, we found one website that they do that. Uh, they, they allow you to change the car model, but they are using a vacuum uh, for a wind tunnel. Uh, so basically they have a vacuum and they have a round cylinder and they have a rail and they bring into the cylinder uh, each of the small model cars, but they have a vacuum for to simulate the flow, which is not rather accurate in terms of a measurement. There's not even uniform flow there. Uh, having doing that with an equipment that, for example, this, I remember we purchased that, this wind tunnel a year ago. That cost like only the tunnel fifteen thousand. I wouldn't risk having something like that automated. That's understandable. Thank you. You're very welcome. Any other questions? Any thoughts? Yeah. Kyrie uh, put in the uh, chat, and I had a similar question. He said, "How powerful can the wind tunnels be?" And I think David mentioned that the. Uh, I don't know if he said the maximum speed, but he mentioned a speed of 50 miles per hour. But I, but I'm assuming that yeah, you know airplanes fly faster than 50 miles per hour. So well, yeah, my we, question is the same. Like, how do you show like you know mock speed if you can do it? Uh, yeah. We we well we definitely can do in a wind tunnel eight mark. So right now uh, a big a big uh, boom is hypersonics. In terms of research, they are trying to. I think there is the first UAV at uh, Mach number from China, and uh, that they have a UAV that they can have, it can reach Mach uh, Mach one. And um, so the, the technology goes there for a lot of reasons, uh, military applications, and there are uh, wind tunnels that they can operate up to eight, ten, twelve Mach. Uh, at UAH, unfortunately, we don't have one of those wind tunnels, but we have a wind tunnel that. Uh, 
Uh, I believe it is at PRC. It, it is for sure at the PRC located. I am not sure if it is Dr. I think Dr. Ligrani uh, works on that wind tunnel and it goes up to 1.4 Mach. So yes, we, you can for a very little amount of time, for a second, maybe second is too much, two seconds, you can reach to uh, these high speeds. But one second of data or two seconds of data at that speed, it's a lot of data. So you can get all the responses that you expect for one or two seconds that the experiment will last until you recharge again and you power and you shoot again for the next experiment that will take maybe half a day uh, to prepare the tunnel again for this kind of experiment, maybe faster. Uh, I'm not, I'm, it's, it's not my field, so I don't know exactly uh, the details. Um, our tunnel goes up to 50 meters per second in the other room that I uh, introduced, so it's uh, faster. Uh, uh, speed is not important. Reynolds number, as you will know later, is more important because it's a, a, you scale your geometries and everything with a non-dimensional uh, uh, like Reynolds number or a Mach number. So you can, you can run tests at slow speeds, but have a big wind tunnel and then your Reynolds number will be equivalent. And you expect to see the same effects as long as your Reynolds number is the same. Essentially, um, regardless of what maximum speed you can hit in your actual wind tunnel, basically because you have to scale it, uh, the wind speed themselves and the density of the air, all those play a factor. And when you scale it correctly, you can just set a certain speed and that will simulate that extremely fast flight or a more powerful uh, scenario that you might not otherwise hit. Just, and just by the way, the Dr. Legrani's wind tunnel was uh, designed by undergraduate students during this summer program and a few years ago also. So that was a really cool Interesting. project. Uh, Tyree adds on, uh, when do you plan to use the wind tunnels uh, for vehicles and airplanes? So I think you talked about maybe getting some models. Do you have some kind of target date for when you might do those? For, for, for the online tunnel that uh, David introduced, um, first, we're going to start slow. Uh, we want to have uh, airfoils, given geometries, and then because this is a airfoil that uh, he's showing to you that 2415 and NACA airfoil. So known geometries that we can characterize their performance. We know what to expect from the tunnel. This is how you start building your tunnel and uh, your um, uh, uh, you feel uh, you feel nice that okay it works as is expected, right? Your confidence is built as you're as you, as you see, uh, developing it. Uh, it makes it a little bit more complex when you have to operate a tunnel from a website. So there is more complexity there. But uh, in our wind tunnels, I mean, you can test any model. You can, I can, you can 3D print something, stop by, give it to the TA, he will load it up and you can do your experiment. That's the cool part of it. As long as you have the geometry of the tunnel, that you know what are the effects of the wall in terms of your measurements, you can test anything you like and you can test and see how it performs. But first, you need to understand that you, you are relying on sensors and you need, it's a relationship with the sensor. You're learning from it and it's learning from you. So first you need to establish that confidence that everything is working as it's expected. And then you can put any model you like. So I don't have an answer in terms of timing. Uh, our target for this summer was to set up one or two experiments in the tunnel, and we are almost there. So. Yeah, thank you. That's what it seemed like uh, in David's uh, presentation that the project is a lot about the calibration and figuring out like how that works and how to make it reliable and things like that. So that's really, you know, practical skills, you know, for an engineer. So um, I think that's really the neat thing about these uh, these hands-on projects is that you're really learning, you know, important skills. It is the most important thing in an aerodynamics lab. Even, even in my labs, the day starts with calibrating the sensors before you test anything. Here in the aerodynamics labs, when the students will come, uh, the first lab is calibration. Yeah, so, 
yeah, Tyree's asking also, you know, you know, how would, what would he have to do to participate? So <clears throat> Tyree, are you a college academy student? Is that right? Maybe anyway, so he, he's a, I, I don't know, I think he may be a, a high school student. So I guess maybe the question is, um, yeah, when do you expect you'll be able to do some outreach with some local uh, I, I would say it's not going to be earlier than January 2022. But this is when we will release the website and we will uh, let the community use it and see, get feedback, update. Next summer, hopefully, we're going to have another RCU on this same project. Uh, so I expect in a year from now to be up and running with different projects. Now, I, I don't think I have an answer on how you can get involved, Tyler. I don't, I think that is more a question to uh, Mr. Cook and because I don't know uh, how the things work, but you are welcome to walk in, come in and see the facilities if you like, if you live in Huntsville, I assume you do. Um, and you can see and you can see what is the potential for you um, to come to college. And then if you are a student here, you're gonna get involved. You, you like it or not, <laughs> hopefully you do. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's one. Yeah, that's a really good point. That that's yeah. My one of my jobs is to you know let students see you know prospective students or new students to UAH, you know see some of these kind of cool opportunities that exist. And uh, like Dr. Kanistris is saying, they, you know they're more than welcome. You know as long as you make an appointment and let them know they're coming, that they'll show their labs and you know whatever they can do uh, to get you interested. So. Um, so Tyree, yeah, when you, you know, if you have an opportunity to come to campus, um, you know, let, let us know and, and we can try to, you know, at least you, may, you might not be able to see it in its, uh, you know, final stages, but you can see what, what they have up to this point and what they're working on. So that's some, that's some of the most interesting stuff sometimes. Does anybody else have a question? I have just one more. Uh, Go ahead. So it's understandable that people, the lab will be used most often, a, a lot by a lot of people, or at least, at least let's assume there's going to be a bunch of people using it. Do y'all plan to, to like help compensate with that, the, the incoming flow of people with like maybe an outside live stream that they can just watch it and see what's going on or that, that is a great question that is an IT question I have never I haven't thought about it yet I hope that is a problem I, I will have to to solve to deal with that means that we're going to be successful uh, my experience on uh, accessing other websites I don't see anything crashing so I don't think that simultaneously like a hundred or two hundred students will be accessing it if this becomes a course with deadlines and homework for sure it's going to happen because if you have a my experience taught me that if a student and when i was a student i'm not criticizing anyone if you have one week to do a homework you will go 10 minutes before the deadline to start doing it so um we need to accommodate for this if we plan but we are not planning to do something like that yet uh, we're going to bring it out to the community, test it with no deadlines. Definitely, this is Tyree. Definitely, if you know what you're doing, if you have someone that he's asking if, uh, uh, if you can build something like this on your own. Um, in fact, I will have projects running next year that students will be developing their own wind tunnels. So you don't have to rely on a wind tunnel that costs 15,000. You can make a very small uh, wind tunnel inexpensive. When I started here as an assistant professor, I, I was given an empty room and I was asked to put a wind tunnel in there, the wind tunnel that you saw. So the first couple of months until the wind tunnel was getting prepared, we were experimenting and we were building small wind tunnels and we we're gonna be, we were, we were doing tests. So the answer, Tari, is for sure yes. Um, but you will need to follow some steps, maybe uh, uh, YouTube videos or reach out to us if you have specific questions, make a plan. 
definitely you can do something like that. But the knowledge you, you will need will have to do with Arduino-based uh, computation, like uh, maybe C programming or anything that's available in Arduino. You really don't need to learn much in terms of coding. Everything is uh, open source. And then you will need to know some electronics because you will be relying on a motor. Uh, you're going to be relying also on the flow. So some basic aerodynamics that you will need to, to see, okay, do I get a nice and uniform flow? What does it take? If you see in a wind tunnel, for example, it has honeycombs and it doesn't have only here. These are just, this honeycomb that you see here is just for dust and dirt. There is more fine honeycombs in here that will, that will ensure that you get a nice laminar flow. And you see how you go from, and this is a six to one ratio that brings the flow in and coordinates into your testing section and makes a very nice and laminar flow. So you will need to have something like that when you're considering to build one on your own. I recommend starting from the tunnel because it's the main part, and then you can move and expand it if you like to make it automated for something like this. George, did I, George, did I answer your question earlier? Yeah. Yes, sir, you have. Yeah, and to George's question, maybe you can uh, have like an uh, I don't know, what call like an archives. So you know, when people give you a model and ask you to do something, you record it and put it in your archive so people can look back and see what work you've done, something like that. We have in the web the idea is that we all the all the uh, examples or the experiments they're gonna be recorded with instructions. So before you even go in to collect your data, you will watch a tutorial. And this is what we were doing for the aerodynamics labs here during the pandemic. We had the TAs giving a complete tutorial of the of the what is the experiment, and then the students were working on the data. This is one step more into having some interaction, just playing with the angle of attack, changing to see how the flow changes. In the future, we may have some smoke visualization so the students can see, oh, if I change the angle of attack, this is where the flow separates from the uh, geometry and so on but definitely we will have video tutorials that's the plan um just the thing from earlier in case anybody doesn't know laminar flow is basically just oh. perfectly straight Thanks. no um imperfections in it it just flies from point a to point b it doesn't move around at all just in simple words the velocity is the same across the section there is no, uh, there is no uh, big fluctuations in the velocity, in the mean velocity from point to point. That's really cool. This is a great project. Um, yeah, I've just, I just put a link in the chat, everyone. And again, that's just a, a link to the UH web page that talks about the summer program. So again, opportunities, um, for students here to work with our faculty and research staff doing really cool stuff like this. So, um, and there's really no, uh, you know, anybody can apply and then, you know, this happens to be a STEM project, but, oh, you know, we do research in all kinds of fields. So, Does anybody did else? Any, any question? I don't think we did. All right, Dr. Canistris, David, thank you so much. Really appreciate your time. This is really You're interesting. Welcome. Yeah, if you all have any uh, questions, you can, uh, you have my email from the uh, reminders, just uh, shoot me an email. I'm happy to uh, find the answer or find the answer for you, so. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thanks everybody. Bye.